Thank you for coming out tonight. This is technically the first installment of our series on money. I'm looking forward to that. Next week, we'll get a little more into the financial side of things, so make sure you come back for that. But tonight, we're going to focus on a little more practical aspect of what we're called to do as Christians. So before we get started, we're going to go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful. We're thankful people, Lord, because we're your people, and we thank you so much that you have blessed us with a relationship with yourself, first of all, and also with each other. Thank you for these people that have come here tonight to join together with the body of Christ and learn more about your creation and the jobs that you have given us to do. We're grateful, Lord. We're grateful people. We thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to share with one another tonight. We pray that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Switch into three. We have switched to three. Mary came through. Thaddeus, you missed the prayer. All right, all right, all right, good. It's awesome. No, uh, uh, uh. What do you, you mean, man? It's good to see you, my friend. Doing well. All right. This is a little informal tonight. We'll just have a little fireside chat here with my buddy Thaddeus. Good evening, everybody. Well, now that you're talking, look at that. Look at that family. So Thaddeus is going to give us a little introduction on his family and how you came to be up here in front of these good people tonight. Oh, uh, man's just said he wants to record hey, this. Everyone can hear me, right? But what about the YouTubers, Daddy? Is you gonna be famous? Here, all right, man. YouTubers. Hey, God bless you all. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I've had a very full day. I started a brand new job today, and uh, I worked really, really hard today, and so. I really just got finished eating a bowl of something and I scrambled it. We appreciate you being here, brother. I'm sorry for my little off, but as y'all can see, my family's beautiful. They are. Um, That picture picture is, um, uh, I want to say around 2010. Um... I had been growing food in my backyard for some years, ever since I had a backyard. And um, it got to the point where I was producing more. I, I, I expanded my space as, a, as a, a thing to play around with in the beginning. And it really just started to produce. And... You know, I kind of just got to the point where it was like I needed to do more. You know, you can only give, you only have so many friends and they get to the point where they don't want no more tomatoes. And, you know, so. (laughs) So, um, you know, there was a combination of things. In addition, um, I sort of got a push on my life through uh, a dream I had and sort of like a, an ambition I also had. Um, I had been working in the service industry for um, a good bit of 20 years, probably at this point. And um, I was looking for what the thing was that I could do that I was good at, that I enjoyed doing, that people would pay me for. And then I had this dream 
where the most high God commissioned me to feed everybody on the planet. And it was a very surreal and frightening dream um, because it was real. I, I felt like I was there and you know, there were points where I really felt like I was, you know, it was, it was too much. And then, you know, it was almost like there was a time where I got sat down and, you know, you know, told like, hey, you know, you have this thing you have to do. I need you to do it. And I went back to work. And before I woke up, I felt like I was changing uh, the situation and I was feeding the majority of the world. And uh, I, I woke up sweaty and, you know, freaked out and I got up, I didn't go back to sleep. And, you know, after some prayer and thinking about it, I, I understood that it was, it was something there more than just, you know, a, a scary dream. And so from that point, you know, I talked to my wife about it all and she was like, you need to, I'm talking too long, huh? You're doing fine, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, not too much longer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thaddeus is a referee, by the way, so I guess that makes me the referee's referee. That's what I'm saying. So I'm supposed to be stopping you, and like, I feel like I'm going long. Uh, but we just, um, it got to the point where, you know, my wife stepped in, and she helped me, you know, put some things in place to, create actual business and um, she saw the got us registered with there's a group in the city called propeller I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it uh, we were in the original class of propeller they were actually called social entrepreneurs of New Orleans at the time um, in that incubation I was fortunate to be around people who had had some experiences that showed me something that I hadn't seen um, and allowed me to be um, profitable. <clears throat> um, I'd worked for restaurants, high-end restaurants for years um, and I'd gotten to know a lot of people who had come through the restaurants and were all over the city and you know going out to eat and people getting to know you because you are who you are or whatever and um, it, it really just got to the point where I used what I learned to be able to provide all of these different people with something that they desired that wasn't really in the market or was hard to find or whatever so I started producing some of my own things and stuff people really liked um, and I started selling it for high dollar and I was able to keep my business going and um, I want to say this is a projection I don't know if we hit it I don't know if we went past it but you know my business was supposed to make uh, something around 300 and I'm sorry two hundred and forty seven thousand dollars in a three-year period and that was on a city block growing microgreens and sprouts and so uh, I don't think I made all that money uh, because you know I think about what I, I purchased and I don't think I bought that much stuff but uh, I thank God because it definitely provided me uh, a means to get out of an industry that I was sort of you know being worn in uh, but at the same time use what I had come to understand there and through the gift God gave me, be able to, you know, make a life for myself and my family. I'm long now. All right. All right, cool. That was an awesome intro, don't you think? That's exciting. That's a blessing. All right, I'm going to go back a few more years from 2010 here. What's, what's that, Technicolor? What is that's, that? That's Technicolor. So, so that's me. That's me right there. So that was our garden that I had when I was little. And I, this man is a professional. I just play this stuff on the weekends. So that's why we're, you'll see tonight, you know, there may be something I say that Thaddeus says, well, if you want to do it the right way. Because this, is, this was my training. That man grew up there. Like the area he's like, around, the stuff we could 
kind of seeing the forefront of the picture, that was like the whole garden where, where I grew. Yeah. No, you, you, you started way past me, dude. Yeah. You can kind of, you, you can't, actually, you can't see my dad, but my dad, so this was rural Kansas, and usually we would have a job to do. He would say, okay, you weed, weed two rows, and then you can go play with your dog and do whatever you're going to do the rest of the day, and I'd, I'd tear through my rows and get them done. My sister's there in the foreground. You can see her. She was... She, she, she worked as well in the garden, but I hated it. I hated every bit of it. Didn't like it. I told my dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow a garden when I get older. I'm going to grow bell peppers just so I can sit there and watch them rot on the vine. That's how much I hated. <laughs> now, it doesn't look like it from that picture, the strawberry picture there, but I put that scripture up there that says, you know, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain because I would... You know, put one in the bucket and one in me and one in the bucket. And so I was, I was happy that day. But so I had a, a rough start with gardening. Didn't do a thing about gardening for a while. Um, but about four years ago, I got back in the business. All right. Our purpose tonight, Thaddeus reminded me that we need to make sure people know what we're doing here tonight. And that's always a good idea. So So our discussion tonight, while some of it will involve practical aspects of any kind of gardening, you know, whether that's ornamental, our main purpose is going to be around food and vegetable gardening. So people that want to get started in that or just develop a relationship with other people in the church that are interested in doing that, getting to know a little bit about what Thaddeus' business is can offer to our local community and just learn more about that kind of local food production, the the circles that Thaddeus runs in. So why do we do this? This, it's fulfilling work. There's something about working with your hands, creating something, growing something that is fulfilling. And I think a main reason for that is, you know, our original charter kind of centers around this type of work. So in Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then it goes on in chapter two to say the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he'd formed The Lord God took the man, put them in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now, this was all before the fall, right? This all all happened before the fall. And so there's something about that fulfilling work. There's something about just the obedience that also carries through into the New Testament when Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So moving along with life lessons, why do we garden? There's so much to learn. One thing to to be reminded of is how we got to this place where gardening is tough work, and it is. Am I right, Thaddeus? It's hard work. Thaddeus says this is easy. No, no. Oh, okay. It's it's not easy. Thank God we're we're not all the same. And uh, the things that are laborious to you might not be with me like that. Like I was saying earlier, my wife helped me with so many things that I think are hard. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But, I mean, is is it strenuous work yet? Does it require you to be consistent? Absolutely. But, I mean... I like it. There's a joy I, I like to the it. work, I so I don't, right. you know, it's not hard for me. It's why I, I chose think you're, to do it. you're pointing back to that, you know, that satisfaction that we get because we are fulfilling, you know, that original charter as well. But basically, for those that that do grow weeds and thorns and thistles, you know, this is why, right? We we are living in a, a cursed world because of the fall. Um, life lessons. Jesus did not go too far before bringing a lesson back to us that related to growing something. Just over and over in the Gospels, we see Jesus referring back to how we can learn things about our relationship with God, about our relationship with each other through the things that we see. And so we're not going to read these parables, 
but I would encourage you to, to look them up if you're interested or if one of them doesn't seem familiar. There, there are more. And I will say we are, we're planning, right, Mary, to put this on the website. So if you want to refer to it later, um, there are some links in here that we want you to be able to follow as well. So I think that's, that's the plan. All right, very good. All right, other life lessons. So these are some more practical aspects of gardening. Certainly there's, there's patience to be learned in gardening. Many times in an urban environment, we get into this pattern. We go to the grocery store to get what we need. We can buy lettuce, strawberries, cherries. You know, we can almost buy whatever we want the entire year. And we forget that those that are living in a more rural setting or a little closer to the land, seasons are everything. And we see that in the Old Testament. So many of the festivals were tied to what the people were doing because of the seasons. So there's seasonality that comes into play that we learn. There's forethought. You know, if we want something, if we want garlic in nine months, you know, we better get that in the ground today. So there's, that's right, there's, there are things that we need to do in order to, that we need to think about beforehand and plan beforehand, whereas the rest of our society is so keyed on now. I want it now. I want to get that Amazon Prime truck in my driveway that afternoon, if at all possible. So the other, other thing is just growth. God causes growth. He provides the increase, and we can see that through the things that we grow. In 1 Corinthians, so Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And, and Jesus took that a step further. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And I will say just from a, a personal standpoint, I've probably learned more about growth and spiritual relationships. A quick story, well, I, won't go too, I won't go as deep into this as I would like, but I was walking my dog once, this is when we still lived uptown, and I passed the most beautiful garden I've ever seen in my life. It was a thing of beauty. The rows were laser straight, not a weed to be seen. The produce was all growing. There was an, a dead leaf. I mean, it truly was a work of art. And I said, that is beautiful. And then the next year, I passed that same plot, or I should say maybe it was about six months later, I passed it again, weeds everywhere. And it was almost worse than if it had just been a lawn. And then another six months, it was a lawn again. And what the Lord showed me about that was that if I'm not diligent to do the work, to maintain, to practice husbandry, to, to take dominion, not only on the earth and the physical, but in my family as well. If we're not diligent to pull the weeds and to, to provide the fertilizer and the opportunity to grow, that's very much what our, our families and our lives can go through that cycle as well. So it's worth putting the effort in because people walk by your garden and say, that is beautiful. And that garden was beautiful and it was a shame when it, it disappeared. So there's so much that that I personally have learned. Um, that last category, humility. We, we have to trust God, right? We put these seeds in the ground and a miracle happens. All of a sudden, they grow. That's God. So it reminds us to not be too proud of ourselves. That's one of the things that's hard for us as urban dwellers to sometimes remember is the, the miracle that takes place to put that that vegetable in the can or in that frozen pack. Anything to add there, Thaddeus? I don't know. You made me remember uh, something uh, that my son actually brought to me. Um, the amount of energy that it takes for a seed beneath the soil to break the surface of the soil is likened to a rocket getting out of our atmosphere. And, um, you know, it's, you know, the, uh, the ratio is so different. But 
to me, that's amazing. You talk about a miracle, like, yeah. No, that's good. All right, other, maybe a little more practical reasons for why we should garden. The first one is it's, it can be just more nutritious. In fact, I would say almost without fail, growing your own food, harvest it at the right time. You have control over what you put on that plant, on how you treated that plant. The, the, the fact of the matter is you can just get better food. I don't know if you've seen any documentaries on our food supply. Ashley and I have watched a few, and then we, we had to stop because I don't want to see that. This mass production, I, I did a decent amount of work in California, and in the Central Valley, it is blessed. You can grow anything in that dirt if you keep it watered. There, they grew corn for the cattle, and these corn stalks, every one of them was eight to 10 feet tall, and they were probably three inches apart. It's just not natural. That's not how things are supposed to, there wasn't anything else but corn. There was not one weed. And they get to that from a, a system of mass produced, um, a mass production really in our food supply. It's not natural, but that's, that's what's happening. So our, our mass produced food is engineered with profit in mind, much more so than your family's nutrition. All right, high food prices and food insecurity. We could spend, Thaddeus and I could probably talk about this the whole evening. We're going to try not to, though, because the world is a weird place right now. So we live, at the very basic level, we live in, in hurricane zones. So, so there's the potential that our supply chains are going to get disrupted anyway. So we all kind of know that especially in certain times of the year, we stock up and we, we have a little bit of maybe more resilience than the, the normal um, community would have because we know we may be without the ability to get to the grocery store. Now, we've all seen throughout this pandemic issues with the supply chain. We've seen our dependence on various just-in-time manufacturing techniques that have now woven their way into every aspect of our, of our food production, that, that things work very well until they don't. Couple that with the fact that food and energy are now more linked than they have been in the past. There are a couple, obviously agriculture has always been somewhat linked to fuel because it's so dependent on diesel. There's a, every tractor, every combine, every semi that brings that food to the distribution center, it's all tied to diesel. 10% of every gallon of gas you now buy is ethanol. I think they're, they're trying to push that to 15%. So now we have a system where we've linked our food supply with our energy supply, and both can be volatile, let's say. You've probably heard about the fertilizer prices. Recently, there's a shortage in fertilizer, some do to the goings on in Ukraine. Ukraine and Russia provide so much of the fertilizer to the rest of the world as well as, as wheat and other food crops. So there's, there's issues with that. And then just this global rise of the standard of living. You know, for so long, the United States had a healthy middle class and we enjoyed eating more meat in our diet as a percentage of vegetables. I think the research I'd done a while back, it takes about three to seven pounds of grain to create a pound of meat. So societies that are much more meat-based are more wealthy further up the food chain than those that, let's say, consume much more rice. Well, other countries with very large populations are now getting to the point that they say, well, we want a middle class too. We like to eat meat as well. So that puts pressure on the global um, food supply systems. So there are a lot of things in play right now that it's awesome when it works well, but there's risk. And so at the very basic level, we would say it would be wise these days to have something on your shelves. Things like peanut butter, some things with long shelf lives, rice, beans, just something so that if, if, 
I believe it's safe to say that most urban environments have about three days of food in the local area. And that's not long. You know, this, this just-in-time supply chain is, is really pervasive at this point. So it pays to have something in the pantry. And I'm running on with all this, so I'm going to turn it over to Thaddeus in case Thaddeus has something to add. You were doing well. Oh. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, everything you're saying is true. Um, the war in Russia and Ukraine is having effects in multiple ways in addition to the price of fertilizer because between those two countries, 70% of the world's fertilizer is produced there. Um, also, 70% of the world's wheat is produced there. Um, and also, Russia is an OPEC country which has now decided to cut oil production by uh, two million barrels a day, which is going to drive the price of fuel up. Um, that reminds me of something. Well, go ahead. All that coupled with our government drawing down our strategic petroleum reserves. I don't know about you, but I don't feel that there's something strategic going on causing us to draw those down to the levels that they are. They were, they were topped off at very cheap energy prices. And now we're seeing the level uh, in those reserves drop and drop and drop and drop and drop for reasons that I personally don't see. So you, anyway, you reminded me of that. Sorry, brother. I'm not sure how to come behind that. Uh, <laughs> We, we could just you move know, on. We could. Uh, I would just say, you know, food insecurity is real. Um, we live in a city that is not huge, but yet 70 to 75% of it is in the actual food desert. We live in an agricultural state, meaning we grow food or we have the ability to. We have acres and acres of land in lower coast Algiers, in lower Ninth Ward, and all over the city. And there's no reason we should uh, have to deal with the effects of what's happening around the world because we have everything we need to combat what's happening to the population of the world. I'm not saying, I, mean, I believe it's to the point where we could possibly help other people with their food insecurity. But again, you know, you, you brought up the government and its strategic, you know, things. I mean, our government has been paying farmers to not farm. They've been subsidizing people to not grow anything. Um, so, you know, yeah, you know, I don't want to get political at all. Uh, but, you know, in truth, food insecurity is a real thing. Um, I remember in our city, in this neighborhood, that my dad would grow green beans and tomatoes. And the lady up the street had melatons on her vine. And this man over here grew the best bell peppers and sugar cane and and my daddy would walk the neighborhood sometime with his beans and his tomatoes and he'd come back with melaton and right. sugarcane and right. and you know i'm not i don't know if we can get back to that but we should definitely um be receptive to that mindset because food insecurity is real that's right well said so at the very at the very basis we think it's wise to evaluate where you get your food and potentially make more relationships in the local community so that you know a little bit more about it from people that are doing this professionally like Thaddeus and others in his network. All right, we're gonna get on to the, a little bit more of the, the, the hows and the winds. So we, we do live in zone 9B, which is a blessing. It can be tough 
in the summer. But the fact of the matter is we can grow something almost year-round, basically year-round. You can have something in the dirt all 12 months of the year where we live, which is not the same in much of our country. So we say sort of because the spring is awesome right now, gardens going in, great time. The summer is tough. My strategy next year is to resort to some shade cloth to try to help those plants. They just get beat with the UV and the heat. It can be very difficult in the, in the summertime. So you well, grow what grows. <laughs> And uh, the, 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 the sun is unrelenting, and it doesn't care about you. I'm, I'm going to try, It doesn't Thaddeus. care about the shade cloth. I'm going to try, though. It don't, the, the, sun, the sun is real, just like food insecurity. The it's sun ra- is real. It's raining on my parade. Grow okra. Nobody likes grow, okra. Grow, grow eggplant. Okay, we have a few people that like your okra. Grow, grow peppers, man. All like, right. You know, so grow, yeah, the, grow melons. The, there are yeah. things that do grow in the summer, but you have you can't just grow. If you put a broccoli seed in the ground in August, don't expect anything. Don't, to, don't, to don't happen. fight it. Yeah, yeah. like na- nature, nature always wins. So if you do any research out online about when should I plant things, when should I not, the vast majority of the information out there is going to center around freezing. We don't really care that much about freezing. I went ahead and put it up here anyway. You do have to think about it, you know, from about, you know, December, you know, December through February. You've got to at least be cognizant of it. But there are generally things you can do to protect your plants even through the the winter. And the fact of the matter is, if you're going to grow onions and garlic and things like that, you've just got to do it um, during those winter months. Am I right, Thaddeus? I always plant my onions before the freeze. Yeah, well, yeah. I've or got mine. before the potential freeze, and it never freezes hard enough to hurt them anyway. So, my they, onions sprouted this they, just just today. They, they're they're, they're beautiful by the springtime. Yes, I got onions. Okay, so you plant onion from seed? Yes, sir. All right. All right. So Dan Gill's planting guide. This is a very useful document. But as Thaddeus and I were talking about it, he brought up the very practical advice that just understand the Louisiana vegetable planting guide is for Louisiana. It's not for New Orleans. So I have found if I, if I abide by that, I've planted too late. So just know that. Um, take advantage of things that are happening on social media. If Becknell is planting his tomatoes and you see that on Facebook, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and get some some plants in the ground start your tomatoes the week between christmas and new year's that's good advice keep, right there keep them in the windowsill or build a little <laughs> greenhouse <laughs> otherwise you won't grow any tomatoes so guess who didn't grow tomatoes this year so i had i had a late start i didn't get them in soon enough they were just coming on strong, and you remember how hot our spring was? Wicked hot this spring. All the flowers gone, wouldn't set flowers, and that's exactly what Thaddeus is saying. You've got to start early. So when you get this, you'll, you can click on that, you can get the guide, just know it's not the gospel. The reason people in North Carolina and places, you know, northern Louisiana even, can grow tomatoes all summer, and we can't. Is it big? Huh? And winter. You can grow tomatoes in winter. Well, well, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, you, if you got greenhouses now. Yeah, that's right. you, got greenhouses. You, you know, even, even if you don't, if you start them in the late summer and grow them all the way up to the winter, you can, especially if you plant like the type of plants that produce all kind at the same time. You can get them just about ripe, and I take them all off the vine and put them in the windows. I have tomatoes all over my whole house sometimes. But um, in order to have tomatoes on a plant, in order for a tomato plant to produce a tomato, your plant must have flowers, and the temperature at night needs to be between like 67 and 73 degrees. If the weather's not doing that with your tomatoes having flowers or what, you ain't gonna grow no tomatoes. 
You, you waste it. You, you can play with it. Sometimes, the, like the little ones, the bushes that grow small tomatoes, tomatoes, they will produce much more over a longer period of time. But like if you want to grow them big, beautiful things you like to buy in the store and the different color ones and all that, you, uh, yeah, you got you to gotta be on time because our climate here is actually a little too warm. Right. Well, look, like everybody's not your daddy, Miss Sherry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Right. We're, we'll, we'll talk about that. Did it make tomatoes? Every time? Like, come on. <laughs> come on now. Yeah. Well, me, then that man... That, that man was touched by God. Like, yeah, that's, and that's we're going to get to... Right. That's a... Mm-hmm. To do nothing too much. Mm -hmm. You got to take care of it. That's right. Well, let's talk about that. When to start? That's what's up here next. When to start? If you've never gardened before, there's the learning curve. So, so don't put it off. You know, get started. I certainly recommend that. You know, even if you think you don't know how to plant, plant something because you're going to learn a little bit more about that. Um, Fall gardens, really, you're probably a little late if you don't have it in now. We wanted to have this, um, it would have been nice to have this series a little bit earlier, but you can still get, you know, seeds in the ground, and if you want to buy plants. All right, we're good. I'm going to go on. Anything else on this? Right. Well, that's the other part of it is you train your body how to how to be able to do that kind of work as well. Is he in northern Louisiana? Uh, uh, no, no. Your cousin? My cousin's a uh, convent in Louisiana. Convent, okay. All right, y'all catch okay. up with each other's cousins here in a minute. We're going to go on to how. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of different ways to garden. This is Thaddeus's raised bed gardens in his backyard that I put up here. That is absolutely not the truth. Oh, I thought that was, I didn't get that off your Instagram? I yeah, thought I, I got that off the that that Insta chat right. account, but I guess it's I It's beautiful, but that ain't me. It's beautiful. So you can grow things in the ground. That's where, <laughs> that's where most things grow. You can grow things in raised beds, containers, hydroponics. So, so I have a mix of in-ground and raised beds. I will say that the raised beds tend to grow almost everything better, not completely but you know I'm, I'm, I'm learning here there are fewer weeds it's a little easier to control if you have you know soil that needs to be amended which we're going to get to that here in a bit a um, little easier access if you don't have to bend over as far so I like raised beds but they're not certainly there's an expense to raised beds even filling a raised bed can be expensive so a lot of, most of our garden is in raised rows and, and that kind of helps out with those long season vegetables. That was a bullet point Thaddeus put in there. So I'm going to let Thaddeus take it over from here. Where, where are you again? Oh, wherever you want to talk about. 
in ground versus raised beds. I, what's, um, the, what's the theory? It, it depends on what you're growing. It depends on your method, you know, what, you, what you're trying to get accomplished. Um, I like raised beds because they allowed me to um, be off the ground um, while I was producing microgreens and sprouts and things of that nature. Um, since you, as Kyle mentioned, you know, you can kind of control more of what you are growing, the medium you're growing in. Um, you can sort of do more in less space because your medium is richer. Um, in my raised beds, I use, I refresh my raised beds every year with uh, compost. And I get my compost from a guy who all he does is grow compost. And uh, he grows it the same way I used to when I was growing compost. So I have a lot of uh, faith in his product. But, you know, it allows me to plant salads and different things and, and whatever else I want to grow also. But, you know, I, stuff jumps out of it, you know. And it's, it allows me to produce things I know I can get a good dollar for. And, yeah. Sorry. That's a good intro because soil is next. So the biggest takeaway on this slide is dirt is not equal to soil. So soil is that rich medium that Thaddeus is talking about. A lot of organic matter, loose, not compacted, well-draining, fertilized. So if you want to know what your soil is doing, you can get it tested. So we've got this up here to say LSU would love to test your soil. I don't know if either of us have ever, I know I've never got my soil tested. I um, feel kind of I've bad got about soil it. tested once. Um, I was putting a garden in where I was growing food and it was a piece of land my father gave me but it, it was sort of like numbered very weird in the city's log. And it's not far from some train tracks. And I just wanted to make sure I wasn't growing food in a brown field or something like that. You know, because it, it, we really used to live right by some train tracks. And he bought this lot, you know, when I was a, a, a tiny little guy. And... Um, like I said, when, I, when he gave it to me, I started to research it, and it had never been built on. It had, you know, and it had, you know, all, all, of, the how, all, all of the lots in New Orleans have an address. Well, the address of this lot is like 13 numbers. And so I was like, you know, what in the world is this, you know? And so I did get soil tested. And I know I said I never did, but I remember it. I, I did. I forgive you, brother. Thank you. So it is a service that's available. It's probably something that, you know, I, 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 I'm going to do it someday. I just never have. But no, if it looks like good soil and things are growing in your soil, you're probably doing something right. And like Thaddeus said, you amend it, you take care of it. Um, what's happening in your soil is extremely complex. The microorganisms, the nutrients, the minerals, it's a very important part um, when we talk about amending, you'll see the bulk sources at the bottom. Schmelly's, that's a, a person that, or an outfit that Thaddeus has used. Sugarland is close here. Um, we've both purchased bulk soil from them. When you're talking about just growing something in a container, you can probably get by with getting some potting soil or something from the big box store. If you get garden soil, it's probably going to be all chopped up bark. Um, there's, it's, it's tough to buy soil, but then if you're filling raised beds, you can afford to get a yard or two. I think Sugarland might have a four or six yard minimum if you're going to get it delivered, but if you've got a pickup or access to a trailer or something, you can go. It's very economical, 25, 30 bucks a yard over at Sugarland. It's a, it's a good source, but that's the, the garden soil 
the compost that Thaddeus was referring to, Schmelly's, I plan to get some from them in the spring when I rework my, my beds. I'm going to tell you, compost is magic. Um, everything I grow in my home gardens or my raised bed gardens, I use zero fertilizer uh, other than compost. Um, you can plant in it. Um, I recommend if you do, you mix it in uh, to what you already have there to get the, the best you know, overall spread. Um, you can also, those, those of you who are already gardening and you want to figure out an organic way to feed your plants, it's something you can do. Take a stocking, and I know those are not as easy to find as they used to be, but take a stocking, and you can make like a big cabbage ball size, tie it in a knot, and put it in a five-gallon bucket of water and let it sit for about three days. And you'll make a nice, rich tea. Put it in the sun so it can get hot and whatever. What's in this stocking? The what? compost. The I'm compost. sorry. Did I not say that? I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure. We're all I was on a roll. I'm sorry. You were. You were uh, doing well. You tie it up and put it in there. Let it sit in the sun three, four days. And then water your plants with that like every two days or at least twice a week. You know, not every day. Every other day. You know, Monday and Friday. And I guarantee your plant's going to be like, <laughs> what's going Thank on? Thank you, Thank you. You'll, 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 grow, you'll, grow, you'll grow some bigger, nicer plants. <laughs> that, that's Something you good. can try. It works for me. That's a good tip. Y'all should be writing notes down here. That's a good tip. So the, I think that's about all we have to say about soil. So let's move on. Let's move on to the next one, Water. So I have a timer and a sprinkler in my garden. I've got one of those little whirly bird sprinklers there on the, the top right. Thaddeus does it the better way, which is, is, is basically giving each plant what, it's need, what it needs with a, with a hose because, again, the man enjoys being out there, being with his plants, giving them what they need. It's, i got to yeah. say that that is in my little gardens mm -hmm. yeah. like right, right. in the field it's drip irrigation mm -hmm. yeah. so drip irrigation I have toyed with it I plan on incorporating it at some point especially in the raised beds because you have to keep up with raised beds they will especially the the weather we've had the last couple of weeks it's been extremely dry um, Thaddeus brought up that yes it's a very economical way you don't waste water but there is a maintenance aspect to expect with drip irrigation, just making sure each season you've got to go through and just make sure everything is actually still dripping and dripping in the right spot. But I mean, water you, is... You, you have to take it up and put it back down. Thaddeus says you have to take it you up. Take it up. Or you will destroy it when you refresh your rows or mm -hmm. whatever. It, it, and, and, you know, it, it wears on them. Also, if it's sitting in the sun, it's also, de you know, degrading. So you kind of want, you, you need to stay on top of it or you'll, you know, you'll set out to water your 100 feet and you'll water 20 and you'll have a puddle, you know. And all those seeds for the rest of that 80 feet, they die. They're thirsty. So this water, it, you know, it's extremely important, as we said, for raised beds. Did I mention that? It's important for raised beds. Make sure you water your raised beds, and especially when you're starting your seeds. So, so right now, we're starting carrots, and they're just peeking up through the soil. If we let that soil dry out even an afternoon, those carrots are going to die. So, so how we plant our carrots, I'll soak the seeds for a couple of days, my little lady makes a, a cornstarch gel. We mix it in a Ziploc bag, cut the corner of it off, and we squirt that mixture in the rows, and it spaces the carrot seeds out. And it's just an easy way, because carrot seeds are, you can really overdo it if you're trying to just sprinkle them. Plus, I like to get them started a little bit early in water, and they're very fragile at that point. So that cornstarch gel kind of helps helps keep them handled gently as well as dispersed evenly. So I'm trying to keep up with Thaddeus and his, his gardening hacks. 
Is that a good one? Was that I like right? it. I mean, oh, I, I got a cedar. <laughs> I put the cedar in and I roll it. <laughs> there you go. I don't have one of those. <laughs> All right, so water your plants. All right, weed control. So there are a lot of ways to control your weeds. I think that's Thaddeus on his weeder down there in the bottom right corner. That's not Thaddeus. So the hard way is just getting out there. That's basically getting on your hands and knees and getting rid of these weeds. So mulch is awesome. Each one of these that we have up there has its, its pros and its cons. Leaves are great because you, know, you probably have a lot of them at the end of the year. You won't have them all year. Wood chips, there's some debate. It can, it can take a little nitrogen out of your dirt as it breaks down the wood chips into, but it is organic material. Um, you probably should stay away from hay. If there's, and I don't have a source for this stuff, so I'm not saying I know where to go buy wheat straw, but straw is actually quite good because that's what's left over after they've taken most of the, the weeds and the, the seed out of the material so you're not just adding to your seed bank, your weed seed bank in your, in your garden and then pine straw and bark as well. But black or clear plastic is actually also a very good mulch. I typically use plastic to, to cut down on the weeds if I'm letting a couple of rows sit for a few weeks or a month during the summer to kill off if I had a particularly rough time and just let a lot of weeds go to seed in that particular row, I'll go ahead and put plastic over to, to, to knock it down. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it. That is Thaddeus's picture on the top right though, with the If plastic. you wanna grow a lot of tomatoes, use red colored mulch. Red mulch. Now that sounds like a wives tale. I what know do you it think? sounds crazy, but red mulch. It's hard to find, but it works. No, it's red plastic mulch. I'm sorry, red plastic mulch, not the, not the red bark stuff that probably has a chemical in it and ruin your food, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on after that garden hack, I might have to try that one. I will say, I wonder if part of it is the reflectivity because I will say I had a neighbor that grew his tomatoes on a dock on his lake and it got the direct sun and it got the underside of the leaves got, got that as well from the, the water surface. Reflection, that's important. We talked about that last week, didn't we? Re reflection? Reflection, yeah. You know, Sunday. so I, mean, I, I, I told you, I'm, I'm still combing through a lot of stuff from your sermon. That was good. <laughs> reflection. All right, so my father, who I'll say is my father in gardening, um, I watched this man do some amazing things. Reflection. I watched my dad grow food in a dark corner of a garden, of, a, of his yard. And he had about three mirrors that were in strategic places. And... He would get sun to hit one of them in the morning, sun to hit one of them in the noon, and in the afternoon, evening. And my dad grew all kinds of food from the reflection of the sun. So, yeah, so, it, it's, it's, so, I don't know. I just, since we're in church, right? We are? I, I don't want, I don't want, uh, Pastor Ryan, don't get mad at me. Uh, I don't know, I don't want to say anything that goes against our shepherd, but man, we are God's image. We are God's image, y'all. Mm -hmm. And my father grew food with the image of the sun. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say we gods or anything like that, but let's not lose sight that we are God's image. That'll preach. All right. I'm sorry. That'll preach. I had, to, I had to get that in there. I don't Thank know. You. Next time Pastor Ryan needs somebody to <laughs> fill in the pulpit, I think we got an option here. I'm going to talk to Pastor Ryan about it. All right, before we move off weed control, cover crops. I have only personally ever used Crowder peas. We grew those this last summer. 
Um, there's, a, there's a debate on if you want to fix nitrogen in your soil, you probably need to kill those off before they go to seed, and I think that's probably true. I didn't because we wanted to eat the crowder peas and they were so good, so we just let them go. But that's a way that you can get a fast growing plant to pop up and kind of keep the, the weed pressure down if you're not going to, to use your entire garden through the summer. They, that's a summer crop. It grows very well in the, in the heat. I haven't used any of the others. And that's another thing you can grow in the summer when you don't want to eat okra. Nobody likes okra. So grow, grow, grow crowder peas. Crowder peas. That's where it's at. Field peas. My little lady Black and Emily can give you a recipe. Purple hull peas. Mm -hmm. All of them grow. Speckled butter beans. The point of, of this basically to keep your weeds under control, make your life a little easier, just try to to think about your seed bank. Don't let those weeds get as high as, as they need to be before they set seeds because then you'll just, you've got a few seasons of just dealing with it. So try to keep on top of that and it'll make your life a lot easier. All right, pests and disease. We, have a, we, we live in a hot, humid climate, so a lot of times the problems that we have in the summertime growing are due to, to disease. There, there are a lot of Diseases that can be either a fungus or, or various um, actual bugs. I have been battling squash vine borers. Stink and bugs. Stink bugs? Stink bugs. That's nasty. So there, there are a lot of things, and depending on what your gardening philosophy is, you may choose to use various chemicals. You may choose to go completely organic. You may wonder why in the world do we have ducks on the pest and disease problem. I've heard it said that if you have too many snails in your garden, you don't have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. Because apparently those ducks will clean up on those snails and worms. And I don't have any ducks, but I've heard they work very well. Give me some ducks. You gotta get you some ducks, not chickens. Don't put a chicken in your garden, but ducks. So that's, um, I, I have tried on the squash vine borers, the BT injected into the plant because they burrow down into the, into the stalk and basically eat your plant from the inside so out. BT is for uh, soft bodied. Worms. Yeah, worms. Uh, so anything that doesn't have like an exoskeleton, mm -hmm. BT, uh, I wanna say the chemical name is thuricide. That you can, you, if you find thuricide, you can just buy it. Thuricide is a chemical used by the FDA in organic farming. I want to say you, you are clear to eat food within like 12 hours. It's a natural occurring compound. It's not mm -hmm. uh, something somebody's making. They're, they're getting it from nature, yeah. and those bugs don't like it. Right. Also, uh, there's another product called spinosid. Uh, spinosad uh, is actually for hard-bodied um, insects, and it is also approved by the USDA for uh, organic farming. There you go. Good tips. All right, moving along here, we're going to... Um, this is a, a slide of places that we, the two of us, have gotten seeds from. It's it's probably best not to go to Lowe's or Home Depot. You can get good seeds to grow at your big box store, but there are certain varieties that have been tweaked to grow better in our climate than others. So, so Seeds for the South, it's a, it's a small operation. I've used them. Um, they germinate well. Johnny's Seeds, a lot of information. Even if you don't buy from Johnny's, you can go there and they've got a lot of information about when to expect to harvest and how to plant and how to thin. Mountain Valley Seed Company, someone that Thaddeus has used. Burpee, oh, go ahead. Mountain Valley, if you're planting a lot, very good prices, very good seed. And so down at the bottom, you'll see that saved seeds. You can absolutely save seeds. Now to do that, like Thaddeus was talking about, or I guess really Miss Cheryl was talking about, you know, her dad was, put a, a tomato in the ground, I guarantee that was not a hybrid variety. So if you're planting heirloom seeds, you can usually get those to propagate year after year. If you're planting any kind of hybrids, especially, I guess, the tomatoes and corn, you know, you probably need to shy away. There's a whole, there's a whole corner of the interwebs 
about saving seeds. There's a lot to learn about ways to do it more efficiently. There's a, there's a whole aspect of gardening that goes into saving seeds, but it is absolutely something that you should do. Other resources. First of all, we got a show fresh up there right off the bat. So I will say, why, why is Thaddeus' company, why did I put this number one on our resource? This is this man's profession. So if you get into a situation where you just need somebody that knows something to come take a look, Thaddeus does offer you know, a service. I think somebody has his hand up, but I'm going to keep talking for a minute. I, the, what I want to communicate is don't abuse the man by having him come over after church every Sunday to look at your garden. If you, if, maybe pay him a little consulting fee if, if you're getting good value out the man. But Show Fresh is a, you know, it's a local, obviously very closely connected to connect um, source for, for local produce. So, Would you like to say something, Thaddeus? I would love to no. sell all of you fresh food. I would love to sell all of you fresh food. Um, I don't know. I, I was telling Kyle, I really don't want to. You know, this is my family. This is church, right? Like, uh, I come here to get filled and fellowship with like-minded people and, you know, have a place to press in when I need and be support for other people when they need. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I feel kind of weird trying to do business here, right? I don't, I don't want jesus to come and flip all my tables over you know what i mean uh at the, at the same time i would love to sell all of you fresh food uh I, I make jellies i make jams and pickles and um i can put my hands on almost if it's out there uh and it's in our market i can probably find it and bring it to you um i do a delivery service on saturdays um I don't know, this new job may switch me up. I don't know. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to uh, bring my gift more into the family. We'd love to have it. So Thaddeus is transitioning right now with where his pop-up location is. But th this is a link if you get this download. But on the first page you saw, both on Instagram and Facebook, you can keep in touch with where Thaddeus is going to be, as well as here on Sundays. Yeah, I'm usually on Bayou Road on Sundays uh, from 1.30 to 4.30. 2500 Bayou Road at the corner of Bayou Road and North Dergeau. I usually... Bayou Road and North Dergeau, 2500 Bayou Road. Other side of the river? Yeah, it's across the river. <laughs> um, Bayou Road crosses Esplanade twice. Right, so I'm about um, a block and a half, two blocks off of Broad. Off of Broad, near Esplanade. One street over. All right, so check out Show Fresh. Check out Thaddeus. On the riverside of Broad. All right, the LSU Ag Center. We are blessed with a tremendous Ag Center at, the, at, at Louisiana State University. There's so much information there. I put this link to this home gardening class. I've watched a few of those videos. Certainly have not watched all of them. But the, the good thing there is it's tuned a little bit more again to, to our local climate. If there's something you want to learn about, just amending your soil, what to do, you can go out on that site and, and get some information. That vegetable planning guide, we talked about that already. The Southeastern Vegetable Crop Handbook is geared more towards the commercial farmers, but it's every bit of information you could ever hope to have on what bugs may attack your plants, watering schedule, planting depths and spacing. It's got a tremendous amount of information. I think it's put out by, it's either South Carolina, I think it's South Carolina, one of the universities there. And I listed a few YouTube channels, again, trying to keep it um, relatively close, but it's more about just getting in there um, and 
getting started. So that's the end of our slides. Anything to add, Thaddeus, before we go to questions? No, so, man, you did a good job. Oh, man, you're so too kind. So, all right, we're going to break there with the information. Obviously, we could include so much more information. It's a huge topic. There's a lifetime of learning here. But um, go ahead and hit us with some questions if anything came up during the talk. Oh, Miss Cheryl got a question. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, okay, someone I know used cow manure for um, fertilizer. That's kind of that gross, bad? huh? Say that again. I'm sorry. I'm, you ask a question. Yeah, that's a question. So, um, cow not in foods and plants, you know. Cow manure is um, a great source of uh, nutrient for vegetable gardens and anything else you would want to grow. Um, you, it's um, as far as manures go, it's pretty complex, so you sort of need to let it sit for a while before yeah. you use it, because mm -hmm. it's sort of too hot is the term to use in the beginning, and it will burn your plants up if you don't let it break down enough first. But it's been cow manure. <laughs> you think cow manure is gross? No, I don't okay. actually. Actually, we have a, we have six chickens, so we use we put their their droppings in our compost pile as well. Like that is is saying, you want to kind of let that stuff sit there and think about itself a little that, bit. Before. That one's even more complex than the yeah. cow manure. It will burn your plants up. Mm -hmm. I planted some pole beans one time, and I was using composted chicken manure and uh, <laughs> and uh, I, you know I had all my little holes you know three around each pole and when I got to the last one I didn't have any more of my mixture that I had made and uh, so I went to my chickens and I got some fresh and I just threw it in the hole for the last one and when they germinated they started growing, and that one shot up the pole. And I came back and looked at it like a day later, and it was crispy, brittle. Like, it, it really fried it. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah, and that goes for basically all your fertilizer. Make sure you don't use too much if you choose to use it, because you can do a lot of damage quickly. I have two questions. Uh, one, is seven dust okay to use uh, that are uh, harsh to your, to your planting, seven dust? I'm going to let Thaddeus take this one. I, I do have seven dust in my arsenal, though. But Thaddeus, what do you think? Um, synthetic pesticides are what they are. They're synthetic pesticides. Um, what I will say, as a man who depends upon my crops to <laughs> survive in order for me to survive, um, if I get an infestation that is more than I think my best practices can handle, I will use seven dust. I use ortho. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not one of them snobs. You know, because they got some people out there who will just watch the bugs eat all their food up, and you know, waste all their time, their energy, and their money. And um, you know, I. I I try to stay on top of it all uh, as much as I can so that the environment is not geared for an infestation to take place. I mean, sometimes you get behind and sometimes, you know, nature is just nature and, you know, you, it, it's, it's ahead of you. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, 
And now, one, one quick thing on that. I will say I also use seven for exactly what the same reason that Thaddeus is saying, but you want to you wanna think about your pollinators, right, when you're choosing some kind of an insecticide uh, because those that work quickly after hours, for instance, that's when I, if we have an infestation, we'll go to some of those first that we can go out there and mist in the garden once the honeybees and all the pollinators are back home does its job, doesn't leave a residual. So make sure you think, first of all, the residual for your pollinators, but then also be very careful and read how many days do you need to let this stuff sit before you harvest. Sorry about that. Is it unusual to have large amounts of earthworms surfacing, especially around this time, and they're dying on the sidewalks? Um... It's, it's dry to have them surfacing. So is this, you have a sprinkler? I, I personally oh, I think the, the I, oh. I've seen what you're talking about. Um, is this in your yard? Um, have you put any chemical or anything in anywhere? Um, so yeah, I, I have seen it before. Um, I know that if you put something that they don't agree with in the ground they'll try to get away um but i've seen some of it recently and i just really wonder if it's that the earth is so dry that maybe they're trying to find something else uh because you know we haven't had rain i want to say since the end of july or something dry. huh i think it's at 24 really i think it's been more than well I know I haven't had rain in almost two months, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, I was looking for it to rain today. I was actually right. up in the Baton Rouge area, and I drove through rain to come home, and I was excited, and <laughs> I got home, and it's still crispy and algae. All right, other question. We got Mr. Gerald in the back has got a question. Uh. I was raised in a, rain up well. when I was a child and everything. My mother grew everything. She had a real green thumb. I think she had a lot of success with it. But one of the things that had what it was always a battle was it, is the tomatoes and everything. By the time it, you let them get it big enough, the worms had already got into it. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, when I came down here, all I had was clay, the dark colored clay with a little river sand on the top. Mm -hmm. on the thing that if you were, I'd have to use a raised bed, so I wouldn't, I didn't know whether you, you, you put a line or something, you know, when you pour water these uh, raised beds, how do you control how much water is done too much or whether you try to keep it from uh, running out the bottom and around the edge? What do mm -hmm. you, how do you line your beds? To raise the, the, I use a, a permeable liner like it's strong enough that it's not going to be broken by the weight of the soil or whatever, but water can pass through it. Yeah, you want your water in your raised beds to be able, because that's, that's part of the secret there, because you don't want those roots to, to sit in water and become, um, to get root rot. But we have the same soil on our property as you're describing. It's almost 100% clay. And it took about three years to get that clay to, to act more like soil and really get it amended well. It's a, it's a long, it can be a long process if, you're, if you've got very heavy clay. My so. father used to do exactly what you said. He would turn that clay and he would mix in river sand. Um, when I first started to understand about composting, I started to use that in addition to the sand, if I was planting in a clay bed. Um, uh, the Sugarland sugar land soil is another good thing to mix into clay. Uh, it has some organic matter. It actually has some river sand in it. And uh, tilling the two uh, makes a, a pretty decent bed because the clay is rich, you know, some of the best tomatoes I've ever eaten in my life were grown in that Louisiana clay you're talking about. So, All right, it's 8 o'clock. We're getting close. Any final question before we wrap it up? We've got one more. You got any sale papers? <laughs> For watermelon and uh, cantaloupes? 
I'm, I'm sorry, say the, start, say the question over. Do you have any sales papers? S sales papers. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna start to, I'm gonna make some. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm 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 hand them out Sunday. You still have watermelons? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, yeah, the, um, it's late in the season. Uh -huh. uh, South Texas may still have some, uh -huh. but the last ones we got out of South Texas look like was the bottom of the bin. So. And why is the cantaloupe so hard? You know, when you go in the store and buy cantaloupe, I never saw cantaloupe so hard in my life. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's, pro okay. it's, probably, it's probably what they're using to grow them or where they're being grown. You know, mm. what'd you say? What I said? Yeah. I said four shrine. Yes. A lot of people pick the yes. cantaloupe before they're ready. Before they're ready. And they, they, uh, they let them ripen on the ride to you. All right. It's like tomatoes. That's right. You're good. You're good. All right. We got one more. We got Greg's got a question, and then we'll probably pray and be done. But we're, we won't go anywhere if y'all have something. You need to ask. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, like at the end of planting season, you know, you usually have the vines and all that. Does that, when, when you turn that over in the ground at the end of the season, does that help the soil, uh, you know, any better? Or? I say yes. Putting organic matter in the ground is always a good thing. Uh, some things are more beneficial than others. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing called green manure. And it's uh, different types of things you could plant. I want to say you had some up there earlier. But they're, they're like cover crops, right? So, like, say you don't want to work out in the, the summer, right? You can plant these cover crops. Um, or if, say, you want to take the, the fall and the winter off, you plant your cover crop and you let it grow. And then once it gets to a certain uh, point, you, t you cut it down and you till it in. And it... It's not just organic matter, but it's nitrogen and phosphorus rich matter, yeah. which helps your plants in the. I'm thinking that might be similar to, uh, uh, you know, the uh, compost or something. Yeah, yes and no, right? Well, I mean, it's, you, it, you, you're putting some organic matter in, but you, you really need kind of more than that. And you know, compost is not just the breaking down of a plant. It's actually a process and how much of green matter versus brown matter you're mixing together really matters in the magic that happens. Yeah, and the only other thing to be a little bit concerned about is you don't want to compost or put something back in your soil if it was diseased. So, it's, so I don't typically compost my tomato vines. I'll get rid of those because usually there's some issue with them. There may be some blight or some kind of a, a fungus on your tomato vines at the end of the year. But um, just be cognizant what you're putting back into your soil. All right, so that's going to wrap it. I think we've had, that's probably enough time for tonight. I'm going to pray, and then we are going to wrap this one up. Really appreciate. What's that? Oh, next week. We've got to add for next week. Remember, we're, yeah, we're continuing the God Money series next week, same time. Maurice will be here to speak with us next week, so you're going to be blessed by that time. So, All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the time that we have had here tonight to talk, first of all, about your creation, your goodness in creation, the fact that you have kicked off such a sustainable model on this earth, Lord, things that, that we as humans try to emulate was baked into the design from the very beginning. And we thank you. We praise you for that, Lord. Uh, we pray that we would honor you in the way that we take dominion over the, the little piece of this earth that is under each one of our control, Lord. We want to, 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 to honor you in how we care for that. We thank you so much that you have blessed us with the ability to do that. And we want to remember you as we work in around our home and outside and caring for those things that you've placed under our charge. We thank you that you have given us our charter to take dominion. We pray that we would do so to your glory. I thank you for this time that we've been able to discuss this practical aspect. Hopefully it 
Lord, you would, re- you would bring these concepts to our remembrance and that we would grow things for your glory. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming.